Uh, so, uh, many of you know I've been working on Obsidian in the Mediterranean world for quite some time. I'm going to focus specifically today on Sicily and the islands around there. Uh, and uh, I'm just showing this map from more than 20 years ago, uh, made by Olwen Williams Thorpe, uh, which kind of showed where we were at that point. Uh, or a, a, a give or take. And the idea, of course, is where obsidian came from. What does that tell us about trade and exchange and contacts in the Neolithic and later time periods? And just a couple of the things uh, to note here uh, is there's nothing about the specific time period. There is nothing about quantity. Uh, and some of the arrows uh, are more just for decoration than anything else. Uh, like you can see one of the pieces coming from Pantelleria being found all the way up here. Uh, but why only show uh, that arrow because there's just one piece, uh, whereas the suggestion for only two arrows coming from Sardinia doesn't tell us about the pieces that we're actually founding, finding all the way down there. Anyway, we have lots more information, and I'm going to try and fit that in uh, within the 15 minutes or less, uh, actually, uh, for these sessions. Uh, and this is just uh, some guidelines, really, uh, that while in the time I have, I will focus much more on how we do the analyses, how we determine where obsidian comes from, what the quantitative differences are between different sites, between different time periods, uh, and so on. What I will not have time for is to deal with the other information that's very important about understanding obsidian. What particular kinds of objects was obsidian being used for? Uh, were these made by specialists or uh, more at the household level? Uh, did this change over time? Uh, and various other uh, things. And of course, there's a big difference when we're talking about uh, accessing obsidian from a source that's nearby that you and your people in your village uh, can go directly as opposed to things that are coming from much further away and perhaps if it is over water rather than over land you could be making direct trips. You all know what uh, uh, arrowheads and other kinds of things are for. Uh, in archaeological sites that are very nearby the sources, there is an abundance of obsidian available. Obs uh, the entire lithic assemblage might be obsidian, and not even including flint or other kinds uh, of objects. There are some differences in the uh, color and uh, visible features of the obsidian. So when there was a choice, people might have actually made uh, a, a selection for that reason. There's also some slight differences in the physical properties, that is how sharp the obsidian will be and what kind of objects uh, it, it would be used for. In the Western Mediterranean, obsidian, the beginning of obsidian use, is very tightly tied to the introduction of agriculture and animal husbandry, the beginning of the Neolithic, uh, which in southern Italy and Sicily is uh, around 6,200, 6,000 or so uh, uh, BC. Uh, and this is also is an old map showing the general dis uh, ideas for general distribution. Uh, let's say that uh, we will make uh, a big argument uh, from some other evidence that it's not really coming uh, from Greece to the toe uh, of Italy, but rather uh, coming this way earlier. That's not going to really affect the interpretations and so on uh, today. Uh, what's called the uh, cardial impressed ware, the first pottery that came in at the same time as obsidian started being used, along with the domesticated plants and animals, uh, is something that is found in this particular area. And more or less, the distribution of the cardial impressed ware pottery is about exactly the same as what we have for obsidian coming from the sources that are here uh, in the central Mediterranean. Uh, we also have some uh, going to North Africa as well. You all know where we are today uh, in Lithuania, and the nearest obsidian sources here are a good distance as well. I don't know anything about whether obsidian is being found here, but just to give an idea of the distances uh, that are actually involved here, comparing uh, that and what we have seen already uh, for the distribution of the cardial impressed ware, these are the obsidian sources that exist uh, in the central Mediterranean. There's more over uh, in the Aegean that I'm not going to deal with now. Uh, but what we will immediately see is that obsidian was transferred over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away. And because we have a lot more water here than between Lithuania uh, and Slovakia, uh, that long distance transportation was much more facilitated by that. Obsidian artifacts have been found at 
thousands of archaeological sites, those in countries where there's been far more archaeological work done, in Spain and France, uh, less so, but definitely uh, in Tunisia and Algeria, Malta and so forth. Uh, and because there are so many different sources, uh, we want to know what kind of particular trade routes and, and other things were uh, established. Uh, this is from 1976, uh, 40 years ago now, um, and uh, again, kind of had uh, more information than the previous thing, uh, showing you know a, a variety of sites in Sardinia and here in Italy, uh, very little uh, at all here in Sicily and so on. Uh, and since then, we really have done a whole lot. Uh, however, uh, this publication just uh, from a few years ago uh, really doesn't change very much uh, about uh, w what we have in mind for the distribution of obsidian uh, coming from these different uh, uh, sources around the Mediterranean. And so what I'm really doing here is quantifying uh, this information. How can we do this? Using a portable XRF machine, which is non-destructive. You can do the analyses right inside museums. As long as you have the access there, uh, this has enabled me to literally analyze many thousands uh, of artifacts. Uh, and this is now a well-established analytical method. It's perfect for obsidian, which is a homogeneous material. Uh, no difference between the geological sample and the archaeological object. And just looking, uh, just like with other analytical instruments, at a few trace elements, we can distinguish between the Carpathian groups, Milos and the Aegean, Pantelleria, Sardinia, Lipari, and Palmarola uh, in the central Mediterranean. One of the earlier studies that I had done focused further north, in Sardinia, Corsica, uh, and elsewhere. And what we found right away was that there was specific selection of the obsidian for whatever kinds of purposes. And so in Sardinia and Corsica, they were using three different Sardinian subgroups. But in southern Africa, uh, so, I'm sorry, southern France, how I can mix the two up, I'm not quite sure, uh, far, far away, they specifically were going and taking just the Sardinian A. And so that really suggests some kind of direct contact between uh, southern France and Sardinia, not what was commonly being used in mainland Italy uh, uh, even. What we also found by analyzing a lot of different archaeological sites in the early Neolithic, I mean that it's a very similar pattern in Sardinia and Corsica using all three of the Sardinian subsources. And that it changes into the late Neolithic period where now it's dominated by the Sardinian Sea, the blue uh, uh, groups here. So why is that? It's not like they ran out of obsidian coming from the one source. This is an intentional selection, perhaps for the physical properties and various other aspects. But let me zoom in in the amount of time that I have left here. Uh, the fact that the obsidian comes from island sources right away involves some kind of maritime transport to access that. Palmarola is never an occupied island, tiny little thing, uh, and uh, just showing that we can, in fact, distinguish multiple sources from different parts of Palmarola. Lipari, just north of Sicily, uh, was, in fact, occupied beginning in the Neolithic time period. Multiple sources uh, there as well. These are easily accessible on these islands. You can get some right close to the shoreline. You don't have to go too far inland to get to some of the valleys and other kinds of places to get the obsidian. Uh, much of the obsidian may become loose and be found at the bottom of the cliff rather than having to climb and, and uh, you know, go and get it out the side. We can distinguish these leapery subgroups as well. Uh, and on Lipari, but in other places in Sicily, southern Italy, obsidian was the major uh, uh, lithic material that was being used. Pantelleria is much further away uh, than Lipari is from Sicily. Pantelleria was not occupied on a regular basis uh, for another couple of thousand years, at least, three th probably 3,000 years compared uh, uh, with uh, Lipari. Nevertheless, the obsidian from Pantelleria was used beginning at the exact same time as Lipari and Sardinian uh, and Palmarola uh, obs uh, obsidian as well. And we can distinguish on Pantelleria five different uh, groups. So where are we at this point in time? Uh, well, I've analyzed about 8,000 pieces of obsidian uh, in this part uh, of the Mediterranean, and what I'm going to focus on specifically is what uh, has been going on just in the last couple of years, mostly here in Sicily and these surrounding islands. 
and uh, just this past year uh, analyzed about 2,000 pieces coming from a whole bunch of different uh, uh, sites and so on uh, there. You all realize that you have to go and find where all of these things are and what kind of uh, storage facilities. On Lipari, where they have three million pieces of obsidian artifacts, you have to go and, and, and decide which ones you're going to actually analyze, whereas at most other archaeological sites, uh, what we're doing is analyzing the entire assemblage uh, that has been uh, uh, collected and so on. And I do, Frank, um, uh, like to... Um, give thanks uh, to my colleagues and students and so on for doing all this kind of work. It's also important to uh, do basic uh, uh, characterization of these objects. Are we talking about cores, blades, flakes, debitage, etc.? cetera, uh, because there can be some distinctions in terms of the selection of different uh, obsidian from different sources, uh, but also uh, uh, in terms of the actual technology, which may also, uh, not may, but in fact also changed uh, over the course of the Neolithic and Bronze Age time periods. Okay. Uh, just focusing a little bit more here, uh, again, you can kind of see Lipari is not all that far from uh, the northeastern part of Sicily. Pantelleria is kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Malta, uh, with its own uh, cultural heritage, uh, is also uh, quite a bit distant. Lampedusa is a tiny little island here. And one that I want to talk about in particular is Ustica. I don't understand why anybody would go to Ustica. Uh, 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 let's say there's uh, uh, definitely people going there for their you know, summer vacation and that kind of thing, but it's not in the direction of anything. Uh, and you have to think about the maritime uh, technology. You know, Sicily is not directly connected. Uh, you do have to go over some water coming from Calabria. Uh, and yes, people in ancient times, while we don't know exactly what kind of boats and vessels that they had, uh, we know that they were able to bring those cows and sheep and so on to these places. So they didn't have to go and cover the tiniest little crossing. Uh, but in any case, Lipari is very much uh, in between Calabria uh, and, and Sicily. Pantelleria may be going if, uh, occasionally to North Africa and so on, uh, but Ustica and just some of the finds that we have coming from there are just really, really interesting. Uh, these numbers are more for me than for you, uh, but let's say it's no uh, surprise that at the archaeological sites on Pantelleria, every single piece came from Pantelleria and Obsidian. Uh, uh, in Tunisia, to the south, also everything comes from Pantelleria and on that tiny island of Lampedusa, which is just east of Tunisia. Malta, though, is very, very interesting. Uh, you have, uh, depending on the particular archaeological site, uh, big differences in how much Lipari obsidian is making it there. And Lipari's on the north side of Sicily. Uh, Malta is on the south side. And so is it going over land? Is it entirely over water? Uh, and, and, and so on. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm going to just move right along here uh, and show you some uh, interesting things that we have found. Malta, there's two actually, uh, one country, there's multiple islands. Uh, but what you saw already some numbers for uh, is the Brockdorf Circle, which is on Gozo, compared with the excavated site of Scorba uh, on the main island, and very big difference in what was going on there. Now, one thing, Brockdorf Circle is a... Uh, uh, burial complex, uh, where a scorba is a mixture of residential and also other kinds of things. Uh, but on, on Gozo, most of the obsidian, 70 odd percent, is coming from Pantelleria. That's not a surprise in that these two islands are there south of, of Sicily. Uh, and yes, 28 percent coming from Lipari. But on scorba, it's the entire opposite. 79% coming from Lipari. And these two islands are very, very close. So this is a great example that there was intentional selection of these two different kinds of obsidian for some purpose. Uh, and we're planning to, uh, to do some use wear and other kinds of things uh, to see uh, whether uh, you know, this might tie in uh, to that. Uh, I mentioned the idea of multiple sources on uh, these different geological source areas on, on, on the islands, uh, because that has something to do with who is it who's actually going and collecting that raw material, turning it into a core, and then to the blades and other kinds of tools. Uh, and almost every piece for Lipari obsidian is coming from one, so one particular subsource. Uh, most of that has to do with the quantity 
uh, of that one source that's available. Uh, but in some cases, the secondary Kinetodentro source is also being used. However, it's only in Sicily, that is sites in Sicily, that have that secondary source use. Not a single piece there in Malta, and in Calabria as well, seems to be coming from there. And in my mind, the idea is that if you have somebody who's coming by boat, uh, uh, or intentionally transporting it across uh, uh, these distances, they're going to go to one place and collect a large quantity whereas the people on the islands will go uh, and uh, collect from uh, a greater variety of things. Pantelleria, though, is very, very different. In almost all cases, the obsidian is coming from multiple groups, which are not even anywhere close to each other. One's on the northeast side of Pantelleria, and the others uh, are on the southern side. So these are other things to keep in mind. Zembra, a uh, small island just north uh, of, of Tunisia, part of that country, it is an, a good example uh, where from three different sources on Pantelleria, that's where the obsidian is coming from. So, doing this kind of chemical analysis, we can absolutely say that, oh, a piece of obsidian found here in, uh, up here in southern France came from Pantelleria, but we know it did not travel uh, as the crow flies. Uh, and the same thing is true uh, between Lipari and Pantelleria going exactly in straight lines uh, in the southern part uh, of the central Mediterranean. Uh, we have to go and put together what actually is going on and of course the transportation. Maritime transportation, what did they actually have in the Neolithic and Bronze Age time periods? We have an idea of Bronze Age in the Aegean, uh, but we don't really think uh, that that's how obsidian is moving around uh, in uh, Italy and the central Mediterranean. Uh, did they have sails, or was this largely dependent on wind and waves and so on and that kind of thing? What, uh, was How frequent was this kind of travel? Seasonal? It's fine to fall into the water in the summer, but you don't want to be falling in in the winter uh, uh, and, uh, and these kinds of things. And if we're talking about uh, the Neolithic time period, it's not like they had a, a business in obsidian. That is, obsidian would never be the only thing on one of these vessels. Other material is going along, whether it's ceramics, uh, whether it's uh, people, animals, secondary products, etc., things that aren't preserved in the archaeological record, uh, uh, but we have to consider things going in opposite directions and so on. Uh, and uh, anyway, you've probably read the whole list there by now. So, what can we uh, 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 say about this? Uh, the first thing, and I didn't really say much about that site of Ustica, which is like right around uh, over here in the middle of nowhere. It has a large quantity of obsidian coming from Pantelleria. That doesn't make uh, any, any kind of surprise. Uh, a very large amount coming from Lipari. But based on what we have found for the amount of Pantelleria obsidian here in Sicily, it really argues for almost a direct trip uh, from Pantelleria to that island. Uh, whether they stopped along the way and got some fresh water, who knows. Uh, uh, but the same thing coming from Lipari as well. The quantity found on this time of, of uh, I mean, having six archaeological sites uh, and just from surveys and other things, uh, something like 700 pieces of obsidian found. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not going like here to southern Sicily and then across and then up and that kind of thing. Uh, so quantification uh, of these results, and that was uh, just done the, uh, earlier this summer. So I'll have to play with uh, uh, those results and things. And as I showed you, Malta here, absolutely direct uh, connection with Pantelleria. They're not going uh, uh, you know, to the southern part across and then you know, trying to cut uh, the open water distances very short at all. So that really tells us something about what was going on uh, based on the obsidian available that we have now. But we have to go uh, once again and put these different pieces uh, of these ancient cultural systems together to really understand what was going on. Thank you very much. Oh, my